Great. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who could make their presence in this amazing cybersecurity webinar. Hope you all are having a great day. Today, we have an opportunity to engage in a thought provoking discussion. I, on behalf of AI Core Spot, welcome all our esteemed guest speakers, the moderator, and all the pretty faces that makes up our lovely audience. Let me initiate with a humble introduction of myself and the company. My name is Nitin Naveen, and I'll be your host for the day. I'm working as a Vice President of Innovation and Strategy at AI Core Spot, and I bring with me an experience of around a couple of decades in consulting firms dealing in and around the emerging technologies. My colleagues Arvind and Naveen will be assisting me in keeping the, today's event lively. Also, they will be stepping in to resolve technical glitches if it comes in between. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to them for their hard work and dedication in making this event a seamless success. This webinar is intended to deliver the new age technological advancements in the current industry. Speaking about the company AI Core Spot, we started a couple of years back, supported by knowledge and innovation partner who is InfoVision and technology partner who is Digit7. AI Core Spot aims to function as a comprehensive knowledge hub, offering valuable information and perspectives on a wide range of cutting edge technology around Industry 4.0, including AI, ML, deep learning, robotics, IoT, edge computing, analytics, 5G, drone, edge AI, digital twin, and AR VR cloud. With the objective of offering an in-depth exploration of all the sectors that involve technology, we introduce a different theme every month, and we have been progressively gaining momentum. Our goal is to become the leading AI-driven community worldwide, where individuals with similar interests like you can contribute to mutual growth and success. We prioritize industry-backed webinars and hybrid events, ensuring that our knowledge base is built on credible data provided by esteemed industry leaders, subject matter experts, thought leaders, and our trusted partners. Further, we nurture the content through the digital content, blogs, videos, podcasts, newsletters, to shed light on the ever-evolving industry. So join us today for one-of-a-kind webinar focused on the role of technology in the banking cybersecurity. We will cover a range of topics here, including major risk in cybersecurity, proper monitoring and governance, cyber controls, best practices for AI governance, and so on. Our expert panel will provide invaluable insights and engage in a thought-provoking discussion that you might not want to miss. And just to let you know, there are lots more in store for the next months with a focus on different technologies like AI, ML, blockchain, IoT, AR, VR, digital twins, meta was chat GPT and quantum computing. May I take this opportunity to further request you all to go through our website, which is aicodespot.io for future updates. We'll be delighted if you could show your love for us via likes and shares on our social media handles. It will keep you all updated on everything what we propose to offer in the coming months to follow. Now, before we get this started with the discussion, here are a few pocket size insights or highlights to set up the tone for the intriguing learning and networking day. We would like to introduce our community partners for today. It includes some great firms, First Bank, InfoVision, Truist, Digital, Digit7, Broadridge, KPMG, and Backbase, who came together to make this webinar a success. We also want to give a big shout out to all our attendees who took the time to register and join us today. We know you have a lot on your plate, so it means to us that you are here to achieve your objectives and connect with one another. Ultimately, our goal as a platform is to help you gain valuable insights and build meaningful relationships. So if you walk away with even just a few innovative ideas or connections, we'll consider it a job well done. So quickly, let me introduce the esteemed panel members. We have Yuvraj, who is the AVP Managing Client Partner, Head of Sales at DFI at InfoVision. He's also the moderator for this panel discussion. Joining him today are five great leaders. Let me introduce one by one to them, to you all guys. First panel member is Mark, who is Senior Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer at First Bank. Second panel member is Gregory, who is Senior Vice President Cybersecurity, Third Party Risk at Truist. Then we have third panel member, who is Kate, VP Global Head of Risk and Compliance at Broadridge. The fourth panel member is Salesh, who is Director Technology Risk at KPMG US. And fifth panel member is Jeff, who is Technical Director at Backbase. 
Just one liner disclaimer before we start. The views shared by the speakers are their personal ones and it's not related to any organization and do not wish to harm anyone. So let's start the day, guys. Over to you, Yuvraj, to begin this exciting panel discussion. Jonathan, hey, good morning, good evening, and wherever the time zone you guys are joining on. Like you, I'm also equally excited to hear some of these perspectives from the industry leaders and subject matter experts, especially cybersecurity is one of the key uh, uh, topic. Day in, day out, we all talk, right? So let me start with Shailesh, uh, you know, to understand, uh, you know, what are some of the major risks on the horizon that you see for both tech and cyber, especially in the banking industry? Uh, if you'll if you just, before you go into tech and uh, cyber side, right? Like you have to see how the banking business is being transformed, right? So old older banks, the bricks and mortar model, is being converted uh, into digital, right? Or there are some banks that are being outrightly uh, being digital. And this innovation is happening all across uh, the levels of the bank. So the digitization, the personalized uh, customer service uh, and maintaining the private uh, data, right? Uh, of all these uh, that the banks collect, right? Or securing any of these uh, data. Banks are, are a regulated industry, so they are expected to uh, maintain a very high standard of uh, security and everything. And if you classify banks as small banks, medium banks, large banks, right? Small and medium banks not necessarily have the large uh, budgets or uh, anything that is associated with it. So how to maintain this, how to maintain this good balance of doing this, providing this, top class security at an optimum level. Uh, that is where uh, some of the cha uh, challenges that are, will be coming up. The regulations, uh, if you look at the, at the federal and the state level, there are a lot of upcoming regulations that are going to drive or impose uh, uh, requirements on banking and in general on financial sector. And uh, so these are the few things that I see coming up in next uh, few years. Yeah. Thanks, Ailesh. Uh, maybe like I'll, I'll extend that with Mark. Uh, Mark, uh, since the specific, uh, like Ailesh uses on the banking industry, uh, as banking as a service grows, how will how, how the cyber teams provide or ensure the proper monitoring and governance? Because that is one of the key uh, uh, risk and issue highlighted by most of the people in the industry. But how do the cyber teams provide that uh, monitoring and governance? Yeah, I, I think let's let's start with the governance component of it first. That uh, you know, from the very beginning of the process of beginning in the banking as a service, uh, you know, bringing that into your environment, it has to start with the vendor onboarding and due diligence that's there, and getting a good understanding on how these platforms are bringing in other fintech partners to provide the various components of uh, the service and. And then maybe fourth or, or uh, you know, fifth party associations that might be, you know, part of them and understanding their security, how they're tying in, where, where is your data going? And, uh, you know, that end to end process that's really needed and flowing and following those data flows that's within your environment and, and within the new uh, banking as a service. And then as you get into the more tactical side of the day-to-day, -day, you know, as as the environment becomes live and you're working with that, uh, really having the access uh, for your cyber teams into those system logs and audit logs and being able to, uh, you know, provide the proper monitoring, looking for anomalies and, uh, you know, malicious traffic and and really, you know, basing the you know, the service around your your current controls that you may have for other cloud providers within your environment, but then also uh, making sure that they have the necessary insights and can do those forensics as needed, uh, you know, uh, as, you know, incidents are occurring or, uh, you know, a necessary investigation takes place. So all that still needs to be uh, you know, part of the governance process that cybersecurity leadership should be taking part in, in your risk management teams uh, in the banking environment and watching over those 
because you know it, as you know anything that's you know on the internet is highly exposed and so the, the risks are higher and uh you know the more that you're trusting your partners you also have to um be sure that you're validating that trust as, as you're working with them so Mark, I think that helps. It's more than about monitoring and governance. Uh, you also touched briefly about how to ensure it, right? So that's that's very important. Uh, while we heard about the risk uh, and and the monitoring and the governance, uh, Keith, I would like to hear your perspectives about uh, maybe one level above, right? About the cyber controls, right? How do we? Because it's a continuous journey. You cannot do it today and keep it for tomorrow, right? So how can we continue to assess and improve? the cyber controls, especially around the third party uh, risk for critical vendors? Yeah, I, I think overall, when when I look at, you know, key risks as a result of le like what Mark and Shalesh were saying, right, we're transforming the industry here. Uh, and there's multiple types of disruptors that are out there. And when I think about risks, I mean, overall, um, it has more to do with, you know, looking at where we are now and where we need to go. From a governance standpoint, I think we need more, uh, you know, clients need more comfort. Um, you know, we mentioned third party, right? So that's, you're gonna see probably a, more of a surge uh, in what's called the SOC 2 uh, type reporting, where you can focus on things like availability, uh, resiliency and integrity, right? Uh, and in addition to that, because that's more of a, you know, independent assessment of security, privacy regulated, you know, some types of controls, um, you know, you're going to see more activity around that. In addition, I think what you need to see, what we'll need to see from a governance standpoint is tools and process implementation and improvement so that we can get to more of what's called a continuous monitoring model, right? I think everybody knows in a large bank, you have audit teams and you have audits that happen and, and they go end to end over several months. Right? And, it, and you look at the rise of artificial intelligence, you have a several month audit, is that really enough time to detect anomalies uh, or really understand if there's integrity issues with your data? So, and, and again, this goes back to things like the themes of cybersecurity uh, and AI, but what I would see happening is, you know, two things, one more of a surge in demands by, by clients for things, you know, at the third party, third party level, for things like SOC 2, where you focus on the trust, uh, the security trust, trust principles, um, and then the rise of what, what what I would call continuous monitoring, where you know the risk management teams that are part of banks and compliance teams uh, get more instrumentation uh, and the seat at the table with our executives to you know continuous continuously monitor the environment for you know cyber related anom anomalies. I mean, the, the, the price, the cost of these controls is, is probably justified nowadays relative to uh, a regulatory fine or infraction. So I hope that helps. Absolutely. Um, uh, it's more about the wise spend, right? Uh, definitely cost is, is also justified here. Uh, thanks for sharing your perspective on that, Keith. Um, before I move on to the key topic, arti artificial intelligence, which uh, plays a key role in cybersecurity as well, I'd like to hear, uh, Greg, if you want to add anything on the initial topics like cyber controls, governance, or monitoring, or risk perspective, what Shailesh, Keith, and Mark shared, before I go to Jeff. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think there are some excellent points made. Uh, I would hit on the governance point. Uh, we talk here about technology and in banking or in any space, but um, to give a shameless plug to my book, uh, Cybersecurity and Third Party Risk, I, I emphasize that it's not the tools and technologies, it's the process that governs them that makes you successful, right? You can have the most expensive whiz bang tool, AI tool you want, and if you don't use it correctly and don't have a repeatable process that's documented, it's, it's an expensive tool, but it doesn't really accomplish what you're trying to get to. And on the third party side, in particular, you're mathematically inevitable to have a, an incident or event or a breach at this point, given that everybody is somebody else's vendor and cyber activity is through the roof. Um, you're just like you're just inevitably inevitable to have a third or fourth party event. We'll, we'll leave it as whether it's an incident or breach to your own investigation and what what transpires afterwards. But th th this this effort, uh, that, you know, 
the attackers now know not to go after you directly. They know to go after your suppliers uh, because their their the, their security hasn't been invested as much as as us in the finance industry and similar spaces, right? Where we've spent billions of dollars over the last ten years making sure that the moats are higher, or sorry, that the walls are higher and the moats are deeper, right? Um, and yet we've had a side door letting letting the vendors in with really li little security checks over the years. So I think we're paying the price for that right now. But we're seeing a lot of technology and tools come on to the to to Keith's point about the continuous monitoring. You've seen a huge uh, a burst of technology in the vendor reputation space and tools uh, in that space. Right. So uh, leveraging those tools more productively uh, to focus on things like less on scores. And those and that's sort of the pretty scores that they produce, like you know the FICO type scores or uh, uh, grade scores, and focusing on the vulnerabilities, the specific cyber threats that are are thrown by those tools, and confirming those are sometimes more productive than having the vendor play whack a mole to try and get their score to a better place, right? So those are the things that I would I would emphasize in the technology space and banking. But uh, great, great, excellent points have been made so far. Yep, thanks, Greg. Um... Before I move on to the second part, right, the artificial intelligence, uh, I just wanted to see if there are any questions or views from the audience, uh, Nathan or Arvind. I don't see anything on the Q&A, but feel free to interrupt me if you guys uh, uh, see anything. So, Jeff, uh, over to you. Um, uh, artificial intelligence is something we cannot avoid, it, right? Everywhere, any, any topic that you go, this is playing a key role. Uh, in terms of uh, what what we are today and how we are uh, tomorrow, right? It, it, it's very fast, right? Rapid. Now, if AI is being used for fraud, can AI be used to detect AI as well, right? I just wanted to hear your perspectives, Jeff. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so there's there's been a, a lot of evolution in the overtaking of accounts. We've seen it back when it was you know, kind of a unstructured language, kind of sloppy emails that were coming across and everybody was like, yeah, this doesn't matter. And then everything cleaned up pretty well. It became very professional. And the attacks that were sent out via email um, were harder to detect. And then what we found is it went back to the, the sloppy language and the kind of humorous um, types of attacks via email in this example. And what we found was the reason that that was so successful is because the bank or credit union staff would see these, laugh at them, and pass them around. Each touch point was valuable to the attacker because then you could do your PDF attacks. You could do different attacks internal by just having these crazy look and type emails, right? People, it went from stupid to funny, and they were really smart and they adopt. I was with a group of our clients. And I was listening to the sophistication of the tax that are coming across all channels now. So um, they can use phone, they can use tax, they can use email. They're coordinating these attacks in a way that really makes it look like a professional reaching out. Um, it's it's hard to to fix stupid, right? So it's it's always been that we'll never ask you for your credit card number. We'll never do these kinds of things. But people still give it up, right? And it's just the way these attacks are built. So as I was listening to the, the team talk about the AI attacks, one of my thoughts was, is there a way for us to use AI as a countermeasure to say, hey, you know what? This actually looks like a train these AI attacks in a way that detects it. So use AI to detect AI in a way, right? Just kind of a theory, but and I'm sure some people are looking at this already, but if AI is good enough to come in, it should be good enough to detect when it's an AI attack. So I think if we can start thinking about countermeasures, because it's going to be difficult for us to keep people from doing silly things. But, you know, from what we've all seen in AI and, and how well you can do voice replays and how well you can interact, it's going to get tricky for us to stay up. So that's part of the concept is if, if we if we know bad behaviors, we can see them. Can we train the countermeasures to look at that even if they're AI? So those are some of the things that we're trying to look at and see what makes sense there. There's some other things around, you know, like honey potting and, and how some of those things would work um, that we're looking at. But even with with honey pots and and things like that, you have to be super, super perfect 
because if you respond to an invalid pin number or password or an invalid credential it has to be perfect it has to look like the real site or you can tell right so there's there's a lot of cost in just maintaining something like that plus we found also in the past the hard way that once you start using honeypots or start going after honeypots they can reverse that on you right they know who you are too as you're coming in so you have to be real careful how you manage those things we'd have to do logins to honeypots or look at it offline right keep off our network and find networks to use so that we didn't get attacked because these guys are really good uh, so that's kind of where we're at we're trying to evaluate a lot of different things can ai be used in a helpful manner here to help us in the countermeasure side that makes sense uh, thanks for that maybe i'll, I'll come uh, maybe like back to you uh, to talk about some of the countermeasures and the honeypot that you briefly touched. Maybe if you want to share some of the examples, so we'll talk about it. Uh, before I go to uh, uh, Shailesh, I just wanted to, I, I see a question from Venkatesh uh, Kumar. Um, any one of you can answer it, uh, whoever feel it's relevant. The question is, how can banks strike a balance between customer satisfaction and maintaining robust cybersecurity measures? I'd like to take a, a stab at that if it's okay. Yeah, go ahead, um, I'm sure yeah. there are great, great opinions from the uh, rest of it. I, I, I almost think you don't need to, uh, rather than trying to strike a balance, think of it as a, as a, as a selling point. I, I, there are, there are enough, there's enough concern among the consumers in the, both in the commercial and retail space about their own security and about the breaches and incidents and events that it, I think if you, if you were to try and make it a selling point, Hey, we, yes, we know we require uh, two-factor authentication, but we do that because we value your security. I and mean, obviously, I'm not a marketing person. I don't pretend to be one, but something that affect it will probably be far more effective than trying to balance it, right? Play play it as a selling feature, make make it uh, a, a way as a competitive advantage to your to your competitors. I think it actually will play up. But I'm eager to hear what the rest of the folks. I'd like to add to that too that. Uh, it, when you're implementing those security controls, it, it's and, and trying to balance that with customer, it, it's it's also important to making sure that it's easy to do. It's intuitive. It's not something that's complicated. You know, putting a complex security control out there is just going to make people find ways to bypass it or uh it's going to hurt on the customer side and people won't use your product and those sort of things so really trying to maintain that balance of how it how simple it is and just because it's simple doesn't mean it's not secure so that's you know that's an important way to kind of look at it and, and just keeping keeping that customer experience in mind yep yeah, I think. Yeah, hi. Um, I would I would say overall, I mean, three things uh, as it relates to trying to strike a balance. Um, I think part of it is about like, like like Greg was talking about, you know, the selling points, but really managing expectations. I think the first thing that we need to do is make sure that our customers understand that we have security programs in place um, and that security itself is a journey, right? Just. Think Think of how security and risk people need to educate the board on what cyber is, what AI is, and what the risks are. It's the same process, right? You're, you want to be transparent. You want to basically be able to reach out to your customers and, and let them know that um, there, there are perceptions. We're doing what we can to minimize the chance of a hack. It could happen. It eventually will happen. Uh, and here's what we're doing to protect and mitigate risk in those themes. You all, I, I think, I hope that answers uh, uh, some of the, I think Venkatesh, you, you should be good with that. But feel free to ask if you have any follow-up question, Venkatesh. Uh, I just see another question from Salim, uh, Salim Ahmed. What are the key challenges in implementing technology-driven cybersecurity solutions in the BFS industry? I think Shailesh, you touched in the beginning, uh, some of these, maybe whoever wants to respond to it, go ahead. I'll take that. Uh, so, even even if you are doing technology-driven cybersecurity solutions, like Greg mentioned, uh, the processes around it, right? The overall system. You can have the best technology, 
but not good people and not good processes around it then it's it's not going to give you a secure environment or you would not know how to secure the environment so it's all all three components your people process and technology all three of them they have to go sort of sync in sync right so your tools have to be aligned if you are going to do a lot of manual processes then your people have to be uh, aligned uh, with certain type of skill set if you are going to do a lot of automation then people have to be aligned uh, with that if you are have a lot of technology driven cyber security how are you going to handle exceptions how are you going to handle false positives all these things they will go hand in hand right and there has to be an upfront strategy uh, the exceptions exception the reporting to the board uh, especially in the banking industry the senior management accountability and responsibility is never taken off right so uh, how the reporting is being done what actions are done by senior management all of that is component that those are some of the key challenges i hope i have you answered your question Nilesh, um, if anyone wants to add to it, or else I'll, I'll continue to move on to the artificial intelligence part, where we started from uh, hearing some of the things, how AI can detect AI, right? So it's an interesting topic. Um, just wanted to uh, uh, maybe, Shailesh, if you, if you can uh, tell, tell some of the challenges that you see uh, in using the artificial intelligence, especially uh, training, right? Training of AI, data-related risk that are associated to you know, to make it usable, right? So if you can share your perspective, that would be good, yeah. Sure. So first and foremost, you have to understand banking is a regulated industry, right? So if you use AI, that doesn't mean the responsibility or accountability of using a certain AI algorithm is never taken off from that institution's accountability. So if your algorithm is not properly trained or if your algorithm is not secured properly, and then you are making a decision based on that algorithm. You may it may come back. Uh, you know, it's a risk. It's a big risk. You may if, if a wrong decision is made uh, based on that algorithm, then you could get fined. You could get penalized. You know, it's a reputational loss like uh, everything else. The other uh, th that's one of the key things, right? So other other areas in U.S. at least we it, things haven't come up to that point. But at least in Europe and few other areas, the artificial intelligence as a domain, it, it, it has started getting regulated, right? So the regulations and laws that are coming up in terms of what is being uh, done to it, right? And then at a higher level or broader level in terms of technology, you have to see what type of attacks that can be con uh, conducted against AI, right? So you have your data poisoning uh, type of attack that can be conducted against uh, AI. Uh, your algorithm uh, can be uh, modified or the behavior of algorithm can be changed if you're using regenerative AI. Uh, any recommendations uh, that are being done using your uh, algorithm, that can be uh, impacted. There are four or five high-level broad, risk, uh, broad risks that have to be assessed, and they have to be assessed on a it, it's a question for the organization. Do you do a point in uh, time assessment or do you have to have an automated assessment of the algorithm and its results? So those are some of the high level questions, challenges uh, that I foresee. Yeah. Thanks, Alesh. Uh, while we hear all the great things about artificial intelligence, we also have a constant concern. Uh, maybe Keith, this is for you. Uh, you know, are there any best practices uh, for AI, especially on the governance side? Uh, because this can be easily leveraged by cyber thieves as well, right? So maybe if you can give some 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 kind of your views on that, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, I guess overall the echo, you know, more along the lines of what Shalesh is talking about. You know, from a framework perspective, um, you know, what you really need to keep your mind on, and I think what we need to move toward from a financial service industry perspective is more of a model of. Uh, uh, validation which you see in like the pharmaceutical industry where you have uh, again a lot of scrutiny a lot of regulation um, it's well intentioned but again there's there's a tremendous risk of uh, you, know, you know bias in the data which can impact management decision making right so 
what you need to do is really step back from a framework perspective um, and assess where you are. Um, based on what I've seen, there's, um, you know, there, there's a couple models that are out there. Uh, one is in, in Singapore. There's another model in Finland. Um, and and I, the name escapes me of the third uh, area um, where, where there are basic, you know, control frameworks they're looking at. But again, uh, what the common theme here is and what's coming out of those assessments is that, um, you know, we need to have more stringent type controls around the, the logic, right? And getting back to my comment about pharmaceuticals, you know, there's the installation qualification, there's the operational qualification and the performance qualifications, right? And they're all report, they're all required for when you manufacture pharmaceuticals, because if you manufacture the wrong way, people die, right? So um, it's not that dramatic in, in financial services, you know, people lose a lot of money uh, or can make a lot of money, uh, but you want to keep, keep the playing field fair for all. And uh, as it relates to uh, the modeling, uh, you're going to see more of validating those models, which they currently do anyway, for any, any kind of logic or model for decision making. Um, you're going to see that probably more scrutiny around the performance qualification, meaning that this algorithm runs, it's periodically checked, right, throughout the process to ensure the data is, uh, you know, accurate. And, and there's integrity to the data. Um, and then there's the, uh, the uh, operational qualification, which shows you that over time, uh, the model continues to work as intended. So um, I, I hope that helps. Um, afterwards, if you want, I can you know, give you a link to some additional uh, sites where you know, people can go out and kind of check out those frameworks as well. No, I think that, that helps, uh, Keith. I appreciate it. Uh, now, uh, I know we talked about some of the laws, governance, and federal data plays, uh, privacy law plays a key role. Uh, the question to Mark, uh, maybe, see, every state, they have their own different uh, compliance rules and regulations, right? So without a federal data privacy law, how does a bank, uh, especially with a given environment, right, in multiple states, remain compliant? Yeah, so, well, first off, uh, just so everyone, my, my disclaimer, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so that, uh, you know, that I leave that up to them to uh, help with that part. Uh, but, you know, there's really, it's it starts with the data and, and how are you protecting that data? And then from there, you know, it, it drives to, uh, it, you know, in the U.S. with so many different states having different privacy laws, uh, California is probably, you know, one of the bigger ones. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, there's other areas, whether it's biometric or, uh, uh, you know, some, some other component of it. it it's, it's a matter of, of, you know, really watching yeah. those states and really kind of taking a stick on the stricter side of your controls around that data and data privacy because you know everyone's trying to gather data and you know i i've said this in some other presentations or webinars you know it's really kind of uh uh <clears throat> you know data is the new gold so to speak and data is you know is really kind of the manifest destiny of today and you know where the the, the person the group that has the most accurate data wins and as we continue with that that concept and that thought process of you know give me all the data uh the privacy is going to continue to be uh crucial and uh you know and for uh larger organizations that's doing business in multiple states in the u.s or multiple countries you know whether you're dealing with gdpr or india's regulations or australia's or us's you know in the u.s to really get that that federal regulation on guidelines on where we need to protect data, how we need to do it, uh, is really going to uh, continue to be more and more critical as additional states uh, make that more challenging. And uh, having those different uh, regulations that 
or some are unclear, some has different reporting rules, you know, all of those components you have to keep up with and it's going to make it more and more challenging uh, for our organization, especially if they're a smaller organization to keep up with that or they won't be able to at all. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I, I do see another question uh, before I go there. Uh, Greg, would you like to add anything on the AI? I think this question is also related to AI. Maybe I'll ask that question yeah. if you want to respond to it. Uh, the question is from Jordan, uh, Jordan, and it is, how can AI makes a positive impact on an organization risk management process? Sure. Yeah, I think that's great. So uh, the way that I see the most advantage for AI being leveraged now, because a lot of the points that the previous folks have made are, are extremely concerning for us as well, would be um, in churning through just the tons of data that we have, right, and making, helping us make um, better decisions. Uh, get those in front uh, before the humans get to them. We, I'd rather have my my teammates, my humans, spend more time doing more valuable things than just reading through reams of data to see which one doesn't look like the other, like the old Sesame Street game, right? So, so it just it's much better use of AI, of, of of AI to try and grab it and have it make look at uh, everything from information security addendums, you know, terms and conditions. Um, what the vendor redlined versus what we expect. Uh, look at uh, M M a master service agreements. Look at uh, things like SOC two, Type twos, uh, SIGs. All the stuff that we get and and produce and churn out. Say, okay, this these are the five areas where the vendor is is falling down on the controls that you expect for this. Right. That that's a great. And then you have a conversation with the vendor about those those five things and not have to wade through the 500 things that you've got through from the vendor, right? That's a, it's a much more use of, that'll be use of both the vendor's time and, and your time. Because a lot of times we spend, we've got, we expect to get um, and have a set of expectations in one language, right? Our own taxonomy. And then we're, the, the vendor has their own more than likely. And we're just trying to kind of figure out the, the sort of Rosetta Stone between the two of them, right? To get them to, so we can successfully in our system, figure out where they're missing. That's where I think AI really can shine and really help us uh, help with that translator between the two systems and help us get better decisions less time. When none of us have infinite resources, none of us have infinite technology. So with the technology and resources we do have, I think leveraging where we can um, in the most uh, successful ways is the way to use AI right now for, for us at least. Thanks, Greg. Um, hey, uh, I want to add one thing. Right? The couple of other areas, in, especially in cybersecurity, uh, you, you'll see a lot of false positives, right? Uh, events uh, that we end up dealing with. So if it can, you know, filtering out some of those false positives, as well as the cross domain connections, right? So if you have your uh, SIM, improving uh, your SIM over a period of time uh, or connecting events from different uh, uh, sources uh, in a better way that can make a positive impact on a cyber uh, security side of things and the overall risk management process if you're just talking about bank uh, right you have your uh, operational risk liquidity risk or credit risk though those are also some of the areas where you can actually make ai can make a positive impact so my two cents on this thanks thanks uh, shalish um, I if I can, I'd like to add to that too. Right. Sorry, uh, you know, right. I, I would, uh, uh, I I would question the, uh, uh, you know, whether the products that you're looking at that's claiming the AI, if you know, make sure that's not marketing hype. You know, what uh, a lot of times what we've found is, you know, they're claiming to be an AI product, but there's not really models, and as you dig in, it's still just this role base that is going on and so it's not really true ai so or machine learning so you know just because uh you know the vendor is saying that it's ai uh question that a little bit more dig into that a little bit more making sure that it's just not the marketing group that's doing that thanks mark there is another question from jonathan the question is how can banks educate their employees about security, cybersecurity best practices. Maybe Jeff or Keith or who wants to jump in, you can respond to it. Yeah, I think um, tying back a couple of things that I've heard here, 
it's the we tried these uh, anti phishing and attacks like I talked about earlier where people are giving up their credit card and it's it's as simple as we'll never ask you for your credit card so quit giving it to people right but it doesn't work and one of the things kind of tying back to an earlier question of satisfaction what I've seen is a big problem when you change security um, you you move people's cheese if you will I see clients make big mistakes is data that they use to improve security for example we want to use um, risk analysis on logins we want to make sure that if you're logging in from starbucks and then all of a sudden your next request comes from another country that seems weird and let's put some blockers in there and let's step up and let's do all these really cool advanced security things but what we see as these get implemented that the ratings go down because sometimes the data maybe on the core system for phone numbers isn't right or they change their phone number lost their phone number there's things like that that cause friction and as we go through um, how we use AI, I think detecting some of these edge cases, detecting some of these behaviors will help us improve it. So there is a positive there where we can find some of the things that are working, some of the things that aren't. And then obviously some of that's related to attack vectors. But I think if we can figure out where the hotspots are, where the problems are, we can improve the satisfaction, hopefully improve the whole, um, whole ecosystem, if you will, of, of how things are put together. Because everybody's trying to get better at it, but it always seems to add in some friction to the users. We got to figure out what that proper balance is. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, probably what I'll do is um, maybe like an in interest of time. We have thirty minutes left. Um, so I know Jeff, you initially talked about uh, the honey pots and some of the countermeasures, right? Uh, to uh, you know, if if you want to take some use cases or explain, like you know, a little bit more about. Uh, what are some of the countermeasures uh, that we typically use to uh, detect bots or credential stuffing kind of a thing? And do Honeypot works in those scenarios? Yeah, it's. It, I think there's. it can all work, but it can all cause grief too. Like I said, you can, if you've good attackers, even in a Honeypot, you can frustrate them. They can detect that. They know what's going on as well if you're not careful. So. When I talk about countermeasures, part of the idea was as we evolve in the learnings of AI, how do we keep up? Well, an AI that learns AI, right? I mean, not to be crass, but it seems like that's some of the things that we can look at. What are these edge cases that we're seeing and turn that back into support requests or turn it into feature requests that we can make the, the, the system better? If we're seeing hotspots or we're seeing different types of of issues in the platform some of that can be related to cybersecurity, which is obviously we're concerned about here but also there's a byproduct of sharing that with the marketing team and say look what we're seeing is a lot of a lot of traffic moves through these different areas and moves in these different ways you can take a the uh cadence keystroke cadence in account opening and you can look at somebody's up down keystrokes on typing in their social security number somebody who is a valid human has a pretty decent cadence on that and what we found is hackers tend to have to look at a piece of paper and type six two five and they, they don't type in a human pattern so there's things like that we might be able to use behind the scenes to just understand more about user behavior with credential stuffing um, some of the things that we're doing is, is using CAPTCHA V3 behind the scenes. So um, trying to manage the friction best. If somebody is a trusted browser, for example, uh, the Remember Me feature, then maybe we go ahead and do that with the, we validate their password. If they don't have that, maybe we run it through CAPTCHA first. And if it shows that it's a bot or it doesn't have a good probability, I know we talked earlier talked about probability, but understanding what bots look like. I think there might be an opportunity there. And I'm sure that some of the people that are doing that at Google or wherever um, are, are putting some of this into play, but I think we might be able to learn from some of that. That's a pattern of, hey, we have a bot detection or non-bot detection, but you know what? That actually turned out to be not in our favor. It said it wasn't a bot, but actually it showed up as a bot. What does that mean? And trying to get that feedback back into the system so that we can use that 
to provide you know proper countermeasures. And I'm not sure if that's AI. It could potentially be trained to do that, but you have to be careful because you certainly don't want more false negatives impacting problems with users. Um, the the point being there that what do you do when somebody is a valid human but it detects as a bot and you deny them access? That's not good. That doesn't help app ratings. That doesn't help us get where we need to be. So. I think there's a lot of opportunity there to understand, you know, what what is the data behind the science? Absolutely, Jeff. Uh, thanks a lot. I think that's very interesting. Uh, now, uh, I just wanted to move on to the trading side of it, right? So, trading is a key in banking industry. Uh, so, key as we continue to improve the clearances or settlement for trading, are there any key cyber risks or processes or controls? that we should revisit within the banking industry? Yeah, I think overall, as, as you know, these organizations transform to banking as a service, um, what, what we need to be aware of is, you know, the regulations will change. We're going to move more toward real-time type data consumption, moving into blockchain, right? Um, Non-repudiability, all those types of themes. Um, so what, what that's really, how I perceive that is uh, developers and, you know, the business organizations need to get it right the first time uh, because trying to, you know, back out of some of these changes would, would be pretty complex and, and could, you know, in theory, you know, impact the market, you know, if it's a serious enough, a serious enough uh, uh, issue. Um, but looking back, um, you know, with with AI and and where we're going as an industry, I think, uh, you know, people need to look at the controls around resiliency and availability. And I think uh, Greg from Truist mentioned earlier, you know, third parties, right? Where we need to make sure that we've got the supply chain correct, um, as it relates to all the players uh, that are part of the trade lifecycle. Um, you know, as an example. Um, you know, if, if there's a black swan type event that's out there, um, you know, we need to be prepared for it. And, you know, looking back at the control models, what you need to look at is really, I would say, revisiting resilience and availability, uh, you know, to, to see how you can maximize your system uptime, how you might need to reevaluate your capacity uh, and, and volume for market type swings that could happen until people understand the real facts around the situation. Um, and again, from, uh, you know, it, it's really just about availability and, and resiliency is, is what I would be focusing in. Greg, would you like to add anything on this uh, specific topic, training? Training. Uh, so what you're talking about there is really the insider threat, right? Is the, the one that we deal with uh, a lot, quite, quite honestly, either through through accident or malfeasance is the insider threat. Uh, we, we do concentrate a lot on, on training uh, uh, in a third party space. You should always be asking your own suppliers, what are they doing for their training uh, for things like phishing and ransomware? Uh, you, you know, we, we do, we're getting better at educating. What I see, uh, I think, really works best when you educate is actually to have uh, a tool in there that that reinforces the education, right? Like a a, a phishing emulator, right? So that it it sends uh, phishing emails, fake phishing emails to your employees, so they can get trained on when to look for and what to look for. Uh, that really helps reinforce the training. The, the training is sometimes a click through, and folks, yeah, I, I, they do the training, get enough through it. You've been with a bank long enough, frankly, you can start to memorize some of these answers on this regulatory training. So so I, I question sometimes how well the training does in terms of absorption. So again, I think that's where we're having a reinforcement tool that that enables you to to test your you know, the retention and get feedback from your, your teammates or your employees is really important. Absolutely. It, it's a continuous journey. Um, uh, so there's one question from Freddie. Uh, the question is, what is the best way for a bank to organize their response if an attack uh, AI is detected? Uh, I mean, most of you spoke pretty much about AI. So whoever wants to jump in, you can jump in here. What, what is the question if an attack AI is detected? Well, what does it mean really? 
what is the best way for a bank to organize their response if an attack is detected if an attack ai is detected i mean ai attack I, is at, detected at, yeah. at this point i don't think it matters if you're yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, you just have to be ready with your playbooks, right? Like, it's not like if detected, then you just have to be ready. Banks have to respond in 36 to 72 hours on if any type of attack is there. Uh, it doesn't matter if it is AI or anything. And certain playbooks, certain uh, techniques or tactics or TTPs, at the, as they are called, they have to be, banks have to be ready with that. So, Yeah, one is on the... Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I agree with Shilash. I think overall, it, it really, you know, it's another attack vector that would need to be considered as part of your security incident response plan or your incident response plan, which most firms should have by now. Um, it, 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 at least I hope so. And, and uh, the, the, who are listening to this uh, conversation, uh, you know, on the tab, like uh, even Keith, one of the speaker, posted all of his views and and if you guys have any follow-up questions feel free to go through those bullets and ask us as we are here uh if the time doesn't permit we can also take it offline nothing and team uh, from ai course part and infosion can coordinate these things with you guys so i know we have 15 to 20 minutes left i just wanted to quickly jump on i know we spent enough time on artificial intelligence monitoring so, uh, from a cyber security standpoint, how the governance and uh, the federal law, state law, I think we, we had enough, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, views on that. Now, I wanted to hear Shailesh from you, uh, you know, maybe like uh, before we wrap up or maybe a one or two right from between you and Mark. So Shailesh to you, uh, what are some of the upcoming regulations you see in the banking and asset management industry uh, that will affect the cyber security and technology? Sure. Uh, if we just look at the broader political context, right? What is happening uh, between US, uh, China, Russia, or any, anyone, right? A lot of regs that government is putting in place, right? And there are a lot of agencies that they are empowering, right? So you have, there is an upcoming regulation from ACC that is broadly covering asset management industry uh that is covering different type of uh, types which were not in the scope before right you have your clearing agents uh various types before right and whoever is not covered by acc regulations they are being covered either through ftc there is a circa that is being passed uh csa is being tasked uh to regulate most of the critical sectors and uh come uh, you know uh, critical companies or organizations throughout the country. So a lot of regulations over next four to five years, you will see a lot of those regulations they will put in place and the country or as, so, as a society, everybody will be better prepared if there was a cyber attack. Like, I mean, if you see the what happened, there was an attack on an oil pipeline. It's not related to what we are discuss, discover, discussing right now but there was a shutdown right so those types of things you will see more or less uh, as we start getting prepared so thank you Silesh, uh, greg or anyone else want to add to Silesh's views or okay Fair so partially uh, uh sorry i'm having some internet here uh, uh you know there's a lot of talk also around encryption and, you know, uh, allowing for monitoring of, uh, you know, various forms of traffic, especially around uh, communications and chatting and those sort of things. Uh, there's there's definitely some areas of risk there if, you know, back doors are put in because, you know, we we know that, uh, you know, secrets can't remain secret. So that's, uh, you know, uh, to have a backdoor put in there is just going to allow other people in. 
uh, other areas, you know, there's a lot of discussion around how to handle AI and and what to do with that. Uh, I can see, uh, you know, various regulations coming uh, with that, as well as, you know, additional controls around privacy of data. Uh, again, probably affecting AI, uh, but or not AI, but encryption. Uh, but hopefully, you know, you know, some others around, uh, you know, the the control of um, how data is being like for AI systems and, and other areas, uh, which is going to be sticky because, you know, that there's crawling of sites and uh, the static data that's out there. Uh, you know, the search engines are doing that all the time. So where does that fine line happen and, and where does, um, you know, uh, AI come into that or where does, you know, the, uh, the current models of, uh, the search engines, um, how does that affect things? And so, um, Probably other areas around, uh, uh, you know, transporting a data between countries. Yep. Thanks, Mark. I think uh, you have some issues with the connectivity, I believe. Uh, so I don't see any additional questions at this point. Uh, let's give a few minutes. Uh, yeah, Mark, you're back. So, so one interesting topic that uh, that all of us are talking today, right? So, especially the Silicon Valley Bank and few other banks after they collapse. So, do you guys see that uh, being the industry expert? Do you guys see that will there be any stricter oversight on cyber um, by the Fed and OCC? Yeah, I, th I think there's definitely going to be, and uh, you know, we're already seeing signs of that. Not only you know from a cyber perspective, but also how the banks are are being run and managed, and uh, you know what, what controls and oversight. You know there was you know based off the you know Fed's own report, there was a lot of lacking in the uh, uh, San Francisco district. So I'm sure you know the individual districts will be looked at as well as uh, this continues to work out. And as we uh, you know find where the economy is going and and. Uh, you know, they, I was reading a, or watching a report today, they're thinking it might be a soft landing in the U.S. And so if that's great, you know, it happens to great. But the, uh, you know, I think for the most part, I think the banking industry is, you know, sound and it's just, uh, you know, there's always some bad characters there. And, and uh, uh, you know, the, the oversight is going to be definitely there by the Fed and OCC and, and will continue to. Uh, you know, look at the banking industry and the various fintechs that's associated with it and, and uh, you know, really continue to, to make sure that the economy or the banking industry is, is uh, safe and able to do business. Thank you, Mark. Um, I think that's pretty much I have to uh, please here today. But again, feel free to add more if you guys wanted to add any of the topics. Uh, but this is a great session, at least, uh, you know, we got all the perspectives uh, from different topics, which is very essential for today, especially with the cyber security is one of the key topic. Uh, but like I said a uh, while ago, if you guys have any follow up questions or any t specific topics you guys wanted to, um, you know, get more clarity, you can always reach out to us. Uh, we can coordinate with the panels here. Uh, I think uh, with that said, I maybe I'll thank you all for all sharing all your perspectives and then I'll Hand over to Nathan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yuraj, and thank you to all the panel members. We extend our gratitude to all our community partners, the esteemed speakers, and the attendees who participated in this forum, which provided a platform for knowledge enrichment. Our panel speakers were exceptional, and we appreciate their willingness to come together and share their valuable insights. Further, if any one of you feel they missed something and wish to look back at the session, let me inform you that today's event was broadcasted on the YouTube page of our company, so you all can see the recording anytime. And if you are looking out for recent technological updates and advancements, log on to our website and social media channels. We'll be sharing lots of knowledge sharing topics, details, announcement of next events, and much more, which will help you register and attend the same. Before we pull the curtains on, we would like to thank InfoVision, which is our knowledge and innovation partner, Digit7 is our technology partner. To understand more in depth and connect with them, all of you can go through their website and stay abreast with the technological advancements. Further, there are lots more in store for this year with a focus on banking, financial, insurance, telecom, retail, healthcare, supply chain, manufacturing, and so on. 
So I request all of you to keep connected with us and enjoy the learning. It was a pleasure bringing this session to you, and we hope that you enjoyed it as much as we did. We look forward to having more sessions with you. Take care and have a great day ahead. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.